You know, I had high hopes for Lord Protector Oliver Cromwell, I really did. In my head, I always sort of lumped him in with Maximilian Robespierre, and my Robespierre video is one of my absolute favorites. I thought they were each a forward-thinking guy who leapt into action and spearheaded the revolution against the king for the sake of liberty and democracy, but then became corrupted, a hypocrite who fashions himself into a king in all but name and becomes a fanatical tyrant with weird religious ideas like banning fun and love and Christmas. But actually, no. You might have noticed last time we talked about King Charles I, the king who went to war against the parliament and got his head cut off, and Mr. Lord Protector here only had his name come up once in passing. That's because... He was the guy who won a couple of important battles, but all in all, well, he wasn't that important to the story. Now that puts me in a bit of an awkward spot, because I think England's experiment with getting rid of the monarchy is really interesting, but I don't particularly care enough to talk about its Lord Protector. So you know what? I'm not gonna because he's overrated and I think I can get away with it. Ladies and gentlemen, the life and times of you-know-who, as told by eight people I think are more interesting. King Charles I was the one who started all this mess, and it went something like this. I need money. Okay, get rid of the guy who burnt through our savings to get the Navy drunk. No! I need money. Okay, first of all, you still need to get rid of that guy. Second of all, we know you've been issuing war bonds. You're not allowed to arrest people for not buying them. That's not how war bonds work. Shut up! I need money! Look, we're willing to work with you, but every time we hand you a deal, you do illegal shenanigans behind our backs. You're under arrest! I need money! No! Not until you stop arresting us, and stop using loopholes to tax people without us, stop trying to abolish parliament, stop hiring terrible advisors, stop making the church guards! Parliament and the king went to war, and parliament won. But even in defeat, negotiating with Charles was like talking to a brick wall. And everybody wanted something different from him. The Scottish, the English, the Parliament, the Army, the officers, the soldiers, the levelers, the agitators, the Presbyterians, Episcopalians, Mammalians, Canids, Catholics, Puritans, and Bobby from Worcester. The flying spaghetti monster is real! Embrace his noodly appendages! But someone's gotta be in charge before anyone can start negotiating with the king. Or not negotiating with the king. Lord General Thomas Fairfax was a veteran from before the Civil War, the army's commander-in-chief, and soon to be the most powerful man in Britain, however briefly. He's been watching as his fellow soldiers grow more and more radical. My fellow generals! Charles refuses to negotiate and refuses to give the people what they demand. He's buying time for his next opportunity to ignite war! Hear, 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 hear. And yet! Parliament, who still has not paid us, who still has not listened to our demands, the demands of their people, still they insist on negotiation. Why do they bother to appease the king who committed treason against his people? No! I'll tell you why. Because they intend to put him back on his throne without an ounce of accountability. Go! Go! The time has come! We rose up against the king! Let's rise up against the parliament! Hear, 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 hear! Order! Order! You're going to write them a strongly worded letter, and that's final. Gentlemen of parliament, I have this strongly worded letter for you, please. We mustn't negotiate with the king. Yes, yes, we, we'll have a look when we're done negotiating with the king. No, that's the whole point. Go back to sharpening your muskets, why don't you? Colonel Thomas Pride, a brewer before the start of the war, was the man sent to Westminster when General Fairfax gave the order to purge Parliament. He dismissed Parliament's regular guards and stood outside the chamber to detain 180 MPs and arrest 45. Thus, the Parliament was purged. What's left of it became known as the Rump Parliament, which put King Charles I on trial and sentenced him to death. 
Charles II was the oldest son of King Charles I. At one point, Parliament had considered making him king when his father refused to negotiate, but after the purge, Charles I was dead, and England was set on this whole republic thing. But Ireland and Scotland didn't get the memo. They still wanted Charles II to be their next king, causing England to declare war on both kingdoms. Scotland tells Charles, We'll support your claim as king, if you make Presbyterianism the official religion. You'll support my claim as king no matter what? No. We'll support your claim as king if you make Presbyterianism the official religion. Yeah, Charles says okay. Presbyterianism will be the official religion. That meant a bunch of Charles's most experienced soldiers, who were Episcopalians, either weren't allowed or didn't want to fight in the army. So it was just Scotland against England, and Scotland lost. But Charles II escaped into exile. Lord Deputy Ireton whom you might remember as being the fellow so keen to end negotiations with the first King Charles, had been promoted to Lord Deputy of Ireland. Now unlike England and Scotland, Ireland was majority Catholic, and Lord Ireton was given more or less free reign to do whatever he wanted to the Pope lovers, so when the Irish army's guerrilla tactics started giving him trouble, he burned down their food supplies. Sorry, did I say their food supplies? I mean all the food in several counties, triggering a famine that killed 20 to 40 percent of the Irish population. So that was the last of the royalist slash monarchist threats to be taken care of. Back in London, Major General Thomas Harrison was not happy with the way Parliament was running things. Even after Colonel Pride's purge, once the king was dead, factions began to form and bicker with each other, elections still had not been scheduled, it was clear England needed a new form of government. But the rump Parliament couldn't agree on anything, and so the whole thing was disbanded by the army. Only, it wasn't just a new government that England so desperately needed, there were all sorts of religious questions in the air as well. After all, the King of England was also the head of the Church of England, at least when he still had a head. And to Harrison, this was especially important. He was part of a growing movement that saw the death of the monarchy as one of the final steps before the return of Christ and the end of the world, and only the Chosen Ones would lead the way. And who were the Chosen Ones? No one knew exactly, but Harrison had an idea. Why not kill three birds with one parliament? Create a new parliament, check, with members chosen based on their religious credentials and virtuous personalities that could guide the country spiritually, check, who could also become the saints that would usher in the end of days, check! We'll call it the Parliament of Saints. So we just need to find a few dozen MPs who, uh, so holy they're better than the Ten Commandments. Where are we gonna find even one person like that? You're looking at him. Against all odds, Harrison makes his ideas a reality, except, go figure, the parliament invented by the guy who wanted to shepherd in the apocalypse? Well, it quickly came to light that a lot of people with similar beliefs had joined that parliament, and the army wasn't ready to turn England into an apocalyptic death cult just yet. Enter Major General John Lambert, a successful military officer who had his own idea for how to run the government. Hey! Remember how we were gonna make a deal with Charles? Aye, uh -huh. well, uh -huh. yeah, sure. Yeah. 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 Yes. How we all would have been happy if he just accepted a constitution? Uh -huh. oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. Well, why don't we just pick somebody who'll sign the constitution and replace Charles? Well, sure. Awesome! I wrote up a constitution yesterday. Please welcome your new king, I mean, Lord Protector, Mr. The Lord Protector was a position designed to have less power than a king, with a few checks and balances, but it was still a lifetime position. Something that might have been a positive if you were worried about some fringe movement like those apocalypse people coming to power all of a sudden. But that means they have to be very careful about who they pick. So? They settle on an army commander that everybody already knew. He was a top general, fought in all three kingdoms, pretty darn successful, served in parliament, politically savvy, not too radical, pretty much the kind of pragmatic compromise pick you'd come up with if you just needed somebody to not burn down the country for a hot sec. John Smith 
was an average English citizen who was happy to not be on fire. Politically, everything was much the same as before, just replace the word king with Lord Protector, and Privy Council with Council of State, and shift the balance of power just a little bit. They even brought back the House of Lords after abolishing it, but they didn't want to call it the House of Lords, but they didn't know what they did want to call it, so for several years there was just the House of Commons and the Other House. The main difference politically was 15 districts led by military governors to put down royalist uprisings. And internationally, did the Lord Protector make a big difference? Uh, England fought a little war with the Netherlands because of some mercantilist law they passed during the Civil War stopping people from trading with their colonies, but the first Anglo-Dutch war was pretty much just spicy diplomacy. There was one big thing that changed for Mr. Smith. You might have heard stories about Christmas being banned because the Lord Protector was an old stick in the mud who hated children and laughter, but those sorts of puritanical laws were passed by the many Puritans in Parliament throughout the decade when the movement was having its heyday. But for all the talks of stability, the Lord Protector didn't stick around long, and all would soon change once again. George Monk was the military officer who succeeded Fairfax as the head of the army. The king who wasn't a king got malaria and refused to take his medicine because it was invented by a filthy Jesuit heathen. Surprise, surprise, despite not being a king, just before he died, he nominated his son as the next Lord Protector. Monk believes in passing down the torch, but a lot of people don't like this kid and the fact that he has nowhere near the credentials of his father. In fact, John Lambert, you remember Lambert, don't you? He kicks the kid out of office, dissolves whatever parliament was currently in session, and brings back the rump parliament from right after Colonel Pride's purge. Monk does not like how unstable this government is becoming. He'd rather there be a, a more stable, long-lasting form of government. Something like the, uh, oh, what's this? A letter from Charles II offering him a bunch of money to support a royalist uprising? Monk mulls it over and decides, Okay, here I am! To put down this rebellion. Good work, Lambert. Lambert then does away with Parliament altogether because they tried to rein in the army, and everyone knows it's the army that controls Parliament, not the other way around. No one is allowed to enter Westminster. Lambert tells them all, We're doing a republic and we're doing it my way! Monk takes up the cause of Parliament and defeats Lambert in battle. He then restores the OG OG Parliament from before Pride's Purge, the one that wanted to negotiate with Charles, and he comes to them with a plan. George, we appreciate it, but whatever new thing you're trying to sell us on, that's just it. I'm not selling you on anything new. That was when Charles II received a mysterious message. Congratulations, you are hereby named King of England? The revolution had ended, in the most British way I could imagine. The king didn't triumphantly reconquer the kingdom, society didn't collapse into anarchy, there was no foreign intervention, everyone just decided they couldn't be bothered anymore and politely asked to do things the old way again. The end.